Hi, I'm Nick with the Manage Engine Insights podcast, and I'm here with Joe Toscano, and we'll be discussing some uh, wide ranging discussion on data privacy, data ethics, and what the economy has to say about data. And so, first off, looking over Joe's history, Joe has an award winning experience in user design with an interest in data rights, data privacy, privacy in tech, and ethical innovation in AI. Joe was a former experienced design consultant at Google before co-founding Beacon, the Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network, a social innovation organization that aims to influence technology and education and innovation using the guiding principles of accessible technologies and information, human-centered designs, transparent business accountability, representative social service and sampling, equitable and ethical impact and standards, and trustworthy operations that are auditable, value-driven, and purposefully considered. Uh, Joe went on to author the book Automating Humanity and made appearances as an international keynote speaker to present the topic, painting a stark reality of information technology that has really far-reaching implications into economics, ethics, philosophy, uh, psychology, and technology in general. A recent development was Joe's feature on The Social Dilemma, which was a 2020 docudrama. It was sort of a film that blends a documentary investigation through interviews with a narrative drama to examine and portray how social media's designs uh, nurture an addiction, manipulates people's views, their emotions and behavior, and spreads conspiracy theories and disinformation to maximize profit. The film also examines the issue of social media's effects on mental health. So with all that being said, that's a lot of um, context for your history, Joe. What what would you say is is the most pressing matter as far as um, your your history and involvement with with data? Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for the intro. First of all, it's very comprehensive, and hopefully, it gives people lots of context for the conversation. Uh, for me, where we focus at Beacon is data privacy, data protection, data asset management, stuff like that. Uh, the reason I chose that is because, you know, I've, I've been doing this for almost five years. This is the fifth year uh, I've been doing this. And uh, when I started, you know, Beacon itself stands for the Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network. The idea at the time was we identify ethical dilemmas, we translate them into a consumer outcome, which becomes a business problem, because then we can innovate rather than regulate uh, and while we do participate in policy discussions and we do hopefully influence policy, we're definitely industry minded and we believe that there are ways to improve the situation through better business practices. So when I first started, that was the mindset. We came out, we we're looking at all these issues from diversity, equity, inclusion, to algorithm bias, to bad data practices, dark patterns, whatever it may be. There's, there's at this point in history, dozens and dozens of uh, problems on the internet people are trying to solve. The reason why we focused in on privacy is that after all this time researching into the problems and understanding the industry, and to be quite honest with you, throwing spaghetti at a wall at audiences as I'm speaking, trying to figure out what really resonates with people, um, <clears throat> privacy seemed to be the most reasonable starting point. Uh, I believe there is a direct parallel to industries we already have, such as finance versus some of these others do not. Um, there's a, also a hard business case. This is less of a soft case that we're building here. It's, it's uh, you know, and, and when I say that, I'm saying it's an easier revenue model discussion rather than uh, an ethical and like philosophical discussion, right? That a lot of these other uh, actions are, are being taken in the tech ethics space. So in that perspective, it makes an easier business case and an easier fundraising and better business model. So we started with privacy because of all those things. And in addition, I believe personally, privacy is the root of the majority, if not uh, all of our, uh, our real problems on the internet. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. We're just launching our second version of our software here in February. We have we launched the original, well, we technically launched the original in like 2019, but sold off part of it to a bigger company and then retained the IP and rights and rebuilt it and relaunched at a different, in a different direction uh, early 2021. And now we're on version two. So yeah, very excited about coming in and talk about stuff. Um, and uh, thanks for having me so far. 
Cool. Thanks for coming on. And with the first topic I had in mind, I want to contextualize the attention economy just because that's a, at least within the social dilemma, that yeah. was the main concern, but yeah. it's, it's very far reaching. It includes a lot of different, um, different angles that people approach it. And I recently found, uh, an author from from uh, many decades ago and a, mm. a, a influential thinker that talked about this. So uh, let's let's just talk about uh, Herbert Simon for a moment because Herbert Simon was a Nobel Prize recipient in economics and a pioneer in artificial intelligence. He used the term officially, he coined the term attention economy uh, like 40 years ago to describe the notion that human attention is the bottleneck of human thought. And then went on to expand on that idea with, with a quote saying, in an information rich world, the wealth of information means a dearth of something else, a scarcity of what it, whatever it is that information consumes. What information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. So that, that, <laughs> He goes on to say other things, but I think that description has been used as almost a, a framework and a, a, a building block for information technology. Yeah. And although he, he wasn't pro this economic one sided uh, attention economy, he he foresaw the attention economy. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have anything to say about that, that quote or the original inception of the attention economy? Yeah, I mean, I think that that points directly to what I was just saying with uh, privacy being the root of our issues here, data privacy, data protection, digital asset management. And when I say that, people are like, what are you talking about? Why is that the root problem of the attention economy? And I think that's mostly because people haven't fully wrapped their heads around how the attention economy works. The superficial understanding and what we really discussed a lot in the social dilemma is the attention economy comes down to the addictions, the impact on depression, suicide, loneliness, all these different things that we really brought up in the movie. I believe the movie created this public dialogue that was uh, an incredible necessity for this point in history. We really needed to have that conversation. But also I, I understand as a professional, as an expert in the field, that there is a lot more nuance and detail to the conversation than, than what was painted in the social dilemma, right? <clears throat> so from my perspective, what he said is true, right? When, you, when you're overloaded with information, you have a, what did he call it? Darth of attention. Uh, there's one or the other, right? You can't pay attention to everything and, and have space in your mind really for anything else. Um, and, and so- It's almost like we're, we're distracted by default. Yeah, now, yeah, right. Because like. we create so much information. But then take a step back and think about why are we creating this much information? People don't really do that, right? Why? Well, it's value. It is value. There is value in information. And until really probably the early 2000s or, you know, as we built a data economy with the internet, that was not well understood, right? We've had information for forever. Information is just retrievable data points that we can use in, in whatever way we see fit uh, now on the internet, a lot more flexible, um, but, you know, previously it was like, okay, there's book, there's information in books, there's information that's received from a radio signal, there's all these different pieces of information. It wasn't until the internet where we really started combining everything and understanding information as an asset. And so that's why we focus on data privacy and digital asset management, because that's the true value in the attention economy. The, the whole model of the attention economy is that you get more attention and through that, through clicks, through engagement, through uh, scrolls, likes, comments, shares, whatever it may be, we're then creating data. And then that data turns into money for a company, right? Whether that's through research, academic research, whether that's through data brokering, that's through product improvements, which make you more likely to garner revenue and maintain clients, whether whatever, there's dozens of streams of revenue that can come out of a single silo of data. And, and so, yes, at the root of it is data. If we weren't making money from data, we wouldn't be trying to get as much attention as possible. Similarly, if data didn't make money, Facebook wouldn't be trying to get people to click on things. Facebook wouldn't be making an algorithm that pushes the most attention-grabbing headlines to the top, right? 
That's why Facebook does it. It's not because Facebook's evil. It's because they need you to click. They need you to engage. They need you to share and do all these things if they're going to make money because it all comes down to data. And so that's where we brought our focus. Uh, that is how I have articulated the concept to the public uh, in all of my discussions, as well as uh, the attorneys general when I went and helped them understand how they can un you know, look at these monopolies uh, from an attention economy basis rather than a tr traditional fiscal economy, because I think we're totally lost in how we're trying to analyze the monopoly behavior of these companies when we're looking at uh, the historical precedence of antitrust. It just isn't working because they're lost. They're stuck. They can see the destruction of competition. They can see, or they're starting to be able to see the elimination of resources, aka the lack of access to data. But what they just can't wrap their heads around is the legal precedent that says, if the price is lower, it's better for consumers. All right? So right now we're at zero. Everything's free. So it must be what's best for consumers. Well, boom, that's where this whole conversation around attention and data comes in, because in theory, in, in literals, <clears throat> financially, fiscally, it is free to a consumer, but we are still paying. We are just paying in an uh, indirect way by creating data, right? And that's why we call it the attention economy. And if you think about it, think about the literal words coming out of your mouth. You say that you pay attention to a screen. We haven't really stepped step back and thought about that. What does that really mean? You're paying attention to a screen. We say it every day, but we have never come to realize what we're actually paying. Yeah, it's it's a we we have a finite amount of cognitive resources to spend within a day, and it, it seems like the the unspoken truth of the attention economy is that it's a it's an economic game. It's like in a game theoretical sense, it's a zero sum game and everyone's vying for whatever is the, the maximized strategy, but it's leaving, it's leaving the consumers out of the equation essentially and just trying to maximize on their attention. It's not letting people weigh in on their, their, the currency of their, their attention and how and where they spend it because they're, they're being manipulated and, and, and inclined to make these certain decisions and those inclinations are getting better and better and better as these large centralized uh, sources of, of data are able to use that data to turn the knobs of all the different features of the UI and all the different aspects of advertising to you know, tilt the floor in such a way that it gets it's get harder and harder to not spend your attention on these these aspects. And so is is the solution to make attention not free in a sense and and have have it be like a quantized uh, uh amount a, an actual currency to spend on on different things well so to start i would argue that even your statement there of they're manipulating consumers is uh misdirected because mm. who is the consumer we feel and the and the public perception is that i am a consumer of facebook Right. And, and I, as the consumer, the person using the platform, reading the post, sharing the things, creating the data should be treated better because I'm the consumer. That's a lie. Mm. You are not the consumer. You are the product. Right. The consumer, the buyer, the purchaser, the spend, whoever it is, people put, pumping money into Facebook is the advertisers. Right. Think about it, too, with Google. Have you ever tried to call Google when you have a problem with Gmail or any Google Drive or anything? And, and what did you get? Where did you find yourself? Well, I'll tell you where, because I know you found yourself in a help center, a giant Google help center, because guess what? They don't have customer service, because guess what? You're not the customer, you're the product. OK, that's how it works. That's just the truth of it. Just look at all the facts and think about it differently. OK, you are the product. You are not the customer. <clears throat> in that regard, though, yeah, I do think people should get paid because we're building their product every day. We are the product. If we were turning nuts and bolts, building trucks for Ford Motor Factory, and then they went out and sold that truck and didn't pay us for the labor we put in, and then when we went to go buy a truck, they said, well, you know, pay us. You, you, I know that you built this, but pay us. Like, you, you don't have any money. Pay us. That's why our economy's gutted. Because you have these small handful of people who are running the tech companies that have turned billions of us into unpaid laborers 
And now they are extracting all of our labor. We're consider that too. We're getting distracted from work, like literal paying work. We're getting distracted from our family. We're getting distracted from all these things. And in that same motion, we are working for these companies and we're not getting anything out of it besides getting more lonely, getting more depressed, having a, a worse society communication, societal communications, terrible politics. And, and it's not just in the U.S. This is a global thing. Look at all the most developed nations around the world. They're imploding on each other. Why? Why is that a trend in all the most developed nations that are all using the same platforms? It's not money. It's not culture. It's not the food they eat. It's technology that's extracting from them, that's destroying their communication lines, that's manipulating the information they're seeing, and not because the companies are evil, but because that's what's best to drive their revenue models. So we, we in a way, have to change the revenue models, but it's, it's unclear completely what that, that solution looks like. Um, I, I think part of what's missing is the clear acknowledgement by employers that their their employees labor is being is being extracted and not being compensated so i i think something that hasn't been discussed as much instead of having privacy rights be from a a ground up perspective of everyone is has the rights to their own uh the exhaust of their data which is a clear solution that i think a lot of people are focusing on is is there any hope in having uh employers across the globe have um it out for their their own employees and try and protect their attention so that they their employees can focus better on work and in, increase productivity is that do you see that as a viable option maybe i don't i don't like i just don't i understand the concept i don't think it's enforceable you know that's the real problem right. that a lot of our regulators are running into is they have these ideas on how to solve it but the uh, they're not enforceable, you know, in, in actual practice. And, and so, you know, I mean, I think there are simple solutions, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk about them, but what if Facebook had a paid model, <laughs> you know, they may not get, they might only get 10% of their users to pay. Okay. But, uh, uh, let's say, so Facebook claims they have over 2 billion users. That's wrong to begin with. That's a lie. They have a ton of bots, but let's say they had 2 billion users, <laughs> And let's say 10% of them, 200 million people, paid $10 a month, okay? That puts them at what? $2 billion a month, $24 billion a year. That, at that point, I, I don't know what their revenue was last year, but uh, I want to say it was somewhere around 90 or $100 billion, something like that. So 24 billion, if that were the case, 10% of their users paying $10 a month, then you're looking at a quarter of their revenue then comes from users. Well, guess what? Now they also have a financial incentive to build a better platform for those people that are paying. And it takes away from, like, I think the root problem is actually that their whole model is advertising. I think if they had 60% yeah. of their model advertising or 40% or 30%, like think of newspapers had ads forever, right? TV had ads forever. We had none of these problems, you know? And, and you know why? Because for one, we knew exactly what an ad was. I was watching TV and I know that's an ad for sure. It's not the show I'm watching. That's an ad. Newspaper, we have ad sections. We know that's an ad. That's news, right? On Facebook and, and YouTube and Twitter and every other platform, they have what they call native advertising. It is inline advertising that looks exactly like a post. And there's one little tiny demarcation that might say this is an ad somewhere. But if you're scrolling at 100 miles an hour, nobody sees that flag. It just looks like a piece of content because it's so targeted to me nowadays and so perfectly targeted that it actually does look like something I'd click on or like or favorite or follow. You know, like we don't know anymore. Most people, you know, people who aren't mindfully searching. So, like, I think that's a really easy way to solve a problem right? Get a different revenue stream, point blank, require that, you know, you can't have like 90% of your revenues from advertising or some, I don't know, maybe there's some kind of threshold we build out. Um, Cause I think really the root problem, and I hope everybody working in these companies hears this, but I think the root problem is these companies just aren't creative. Advertising is not a creative business model. 
That is not a business model. This is it is a it is a indirect revenue model that should subsidize a real product value. There's not value in advertising. It's a hype machine. That's literally it. Like, yeah, it's a scattershot right. method. Like if, if Facebook, <laughs> uh, if if all the cool kids leave Facebook, which they're doing, over time Facebook's gonna die. Like Facebook's gonna die off. Like as the kids move off the platform, they're gonna lose attention. Right. And, and the only reason they have more people coming on right now is because the older generation, all the parents are like, well, my kids have been on Facebook for a decade. Maybe I should go get one now. It's not actually the value. That's not who's driving Facebook forward. That's why TikTok becoming in, in power, you know, growing users is causing so much problem for these, these companies, right? Like there, there's a competition now. Um, but, but yeah, really advertising as a model, is just a big hype machine. So it's not, a, it's not even a stable business model for an investor, you know, um, and and yeah and and point blank i just think it's uncreative they've had two decades yeah. now to figure out a different revenue model to sustain a company in a longer term and they just haven't they just haven't it's lack of creativity i mean the end goal the end goal makes sense it's get it's getting a product or service into the hands of people who are interested in using that product or service and so in a sense it's the it's the issue of the last mile it's how do you how do you not just do all the upfront work because advertising is not exactly doing the upfront work except for the data collection aspect and segmenting, but how do you actually go into those segments and find the exact people who are interested in the product and service? And so uh, I forgot the source of it, but the one solution I found was a uh, turning, turning data into kind of a, a currency exchange where that last mile effect is put into the hands of the consumer and they choose when to engage into the hyper specific yeah. advertising in exchange for the company giving them like a discount for for whatever that product is and so rather than these companies spending tons and tons of money on advertising and trying to get as much information and then drill down into that information they get general information and then let the consumers come to them by offering better and better products and services and giving just a little bit extra incentive at the last bit to trade for the data to make sure that there's alignment between uh the consumer and the the producer well, there's also companies like uh there's one i, I work with commonly uh, good friends with the ceo founder um it's called big token and they are acting as what they're calling a data union so it is a place where you can go and you create data for them. It's really just like answering surveys. Like, do you like this kind of music? Would you sharp a target? Would you, you know, those kind of things. And then they resell that data. It's very clear. It's very forward. They tell you when you sign up, we're going to sell this data and you have the rights to tell us what we can and cannot sell. But uh, by default, we're going to sell your data and we'll give you a cut. So people are actually getting paid, right? There is a value per user for Facebook. They won't admit it. They won't tell us exactly what it is, but there is a value. Imagine if you were worth 25 cents to 50,000 companies. That's $12,500 a year. That's the equivalent to Andrew Yang's UBI, but you know, the difference is you actually earned it through capitalistic work, right? It's not a UBI that's given out to everyone. And, and then it results in, in better suggestions for the things that you actually care about, right? right? Presumably that, that ends in, in... Hopefully, there's definitely ways that can be too. There's controls you need to have on that. But you know, the idea of it, right, is there. And, and I think, yeah, that... Uh, the the additional thing that doesn't get talked about a lot because uh, it just isn't really we're not as a society at this point in history prepared to have the conversation or or quite uh, aware enough to have the conversation. You know, the social dome brought up the idea of attention being manipulated and advertising and, all, and the connection there. Advertising is most often the conversation around this because that is the I don't want to say superficial, but it's like the highest layer thing that like the media can understand, the public can understand, and like we can point to and say, that's the problem. But for me, actually, advertising is not the problem. I actually think advertising mm -hmm. is fine as a part of your revenue model. I don't think it, like I said, I don't think it should be your full revenue model. I think that is a, a farce. You know, even like newspaper, you had a subscription next to the advertising. There's two revenue models for that, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, or two revenue streams, sorry, not models. Um I just believe that, you know, the bigger problem here actually is that we're creating data that's then training artificial intelligence systems that's then going to take jobs and we're not going to get any cut of it. People are going to work themselves out of a job and not even know that they're doing it until it's too late. And then by the time that it happens, they're going to want their job back and the company's going to go too bad. 
you did it. It's not my, not my problem. Go back to college, go get retrained, do something like that. And you're going to have this whole group of, you know, 35 to maybe you know, 55 that they're pushed out of the workforce or their job is uh, deflated in value. Imagine a doctor who's making $300 an hour, then, you know, their job is, is automated. There's a, there's an AI system that you can put in the symptoms and it lists out the potential disease and they go one by one through, you know, rank choices from most likely to least. And they go through that figured out. And because there's this general AI that can parse through all this historical medical information, their job is no longer worth $300 an hour because they're not a specialist, they're a generalist and their job becomes $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. Now to a lot of people, that's a lot of money still. But to a doctor who's living on $300 an hour, you just cut out two thirds of the money coming into their life. You're going to deflate their life. You're going to deflate the value of their family. It's, you're going to see their, you know, like, and it's not just doctors. There's a lot of jobs that are going to go from, you know, $30 an hour to 15 or $30 an hour to even like 22, you know, where it's going to make a significant difference in people's lives. And it's because we're creating the data for them. And we're never going to see a cut for it, you know? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about um, automation like 10, 15 years ago about it really affecting kind of manual labor and, and that being the since since manual labor takes up such a large portion of the economy, that was like a big concern. But really, it does seem like as as AI gets more effective, it's it's hitting a lot of these um, data collection and data processing within these specialized roles like a doctor or a lawyer. And, and so that leaves like you said, kind of a generalist made more heuristic and taking taking leaps of logic and taking um, more interpersonal skills to to actually find value within their job. But it seems on both sides, we're not we're not prepared on a global scale to deal with the ramifications of AI and automation. Yeah. And it's it's like this whole this whole system is is circulating on all these people continuing to to input their their value but no one no one except for the people at the top are essentially getting real yeah. any any uh good that's why i think we have the wealth distribution we do you know i think because of this we've been siphoning off labor from billions of people for two decades now and the people at the top receive the value and those who are actually doing it don't you know uh automation is going to come for the low end repetitive jobs, the the burger flippers, the checkout counter people, the, all those. But it's also going to, at the same time, come really hard for white collar labor. And people haven't thought about that, you know, trade jobs, plumbing, electrical work, all that stuff. That's not really going to get automated too quick. You know, there's a lot of nuance to that. There's a lot of different fittings for different pipes and different types of electricity connections and stuff that you can't fully automate at this point. And probably in my guess won't automate for at least the next 20 or 30 years, if not beyond that. But um, there are a lot of jobs that can be automated either fully or partially. And even if it's partially, you might as well take the job away in many cases, because it's going to dramatically alter those people's lifestyles. And um, I, you know, that's the thing that I'm concerned about. I, I'm less concerned about the ads. It is a problem. You know, the manipulation from the media is tough. Don't get me wrong, but we can work through that. If we have a whole lot of 10 or 20% of the economy uh, or, or, or labor force or workforce who is all of a sudden either out of a job or pushed into a position that doesn't allow them to afford the life they could before, we're going to have issues. Uh, and I think that's what we're starting to see. You know, I can tell you, I'm from Nebraska, grew up in Nebraska. I went to school for psychology. I was uh, really good at math going into school. They told me I should be a math professor. And that's a terrible idea. It's so boring. Um, but, you know, I, I use my math skills in, in the computer world, uh, technology world. It all translated through. But, but at the time, you know, I, I was talking about these concepts of artificial intelligence and wanting to do things with computers. And, and in my community, this was... 14 years ago, I went into college. The language just wasn't even there. No one had even heard of this kind of stuff. I was very deep into computers and technology as a kid. I played a lot of video games and all things, but generally it wasn't there. And still to this day, it's not really here. Um, and so, yeah, you just have this whole world of people that, you know, they're not dumb. It's just like, they don't, they don't require it in their life, right? There's a lot of old ways of life and not only Nebraska, but many other states in the United States, a lot of rural areas too. 
you have these rural areas that like, you know, this is why I think the politics are so split right now. These people are either losing their jobs or like I said, getting their, their roles reduced and they don't really understand why. And then mm -hmm. from a physical, like visual perception, they see on the news, the immigrants, they see in their community, they see immigrants moving in. They can easily point and blame this whole other side of the world, say, that's who's taking my jobs. That's why we have this political divide. And I just don't believe it's true. I think the reality is a lot of it's going by way of automation and it's not coming back. And it's not because of the immigrants. It's a natural progression of economics. And uh, we need to figure it out. The only people who benefit are the people who own the sources of automation. Yeah, yeah but we know yeah. how to transition these people into this new economy. And there's a yeah. billions dollars worth of business to be built around retraining, you know? It seems like it. it's more than just retraining. Like, I, this may be too much in the weeds for, for this conversation, but I've been thinking about recently about, in a sense, every person has certain natural needs for food, water, and shelter. And so mm -hmm. if within a community, if there's like an aggregate data for what those needs are, that data can go upstream towards a higher level of, of government mm -hmm. and then that government can filter out and help um, not redistribute necessarily, but reallocate and help um, make sure that people within a given area are producing enough economic output to satisfy just at least the basic needs of all the people within that area. And the issue with a lot of tech companies is that um, there are these centralized sources that draw from many many uh, geographic locations and then source it into one one spot. And yeah. so that I think part of the part of the economic revitalization that we might see in the future is having the economic output of individual and economic input of an individual be much closer to where they're situated physically, despite this digital realm allowing this this connection across the globe. And so maybe it's skipping forward a bit, but that does touch upon um, some of what we wanted to talk about with like rural revival and talking about um, yeah. supporting the economic incentives of these rural economies. So yeah, yeah. is is beyond beyond government, like what what can what can be done about um, supporting the economic uh, feasibility of rural environments, rural communities? Yeah. I think it really comes to training, man. Like uh, I so. I'll tell you, I am already working on this and, and I have friends working on this. Um, I, I've been going to a place called Cannon City, Colorado on a regular basis. I actually bought a property out there last year to because I've been going so much. I'm like, well, I'll just rent it when I'm not there. Um, but yeah, some of the guys out there, they've been doing this work of trying to do rural revitalization for uh, going on a decade now. And they've created a tech start program there that is creating uh, facilities for co-working, um, you know, because there's a, in a rural area, there might be a lot of people working on futuristic kind of stuff or have these ideas like I did, but not have a team of people around them to talk to or communities feel engaged. They feel isolated. So they stood this up, that place filled within, I think it was like a year and a half. It was filled in revenue driving on the property itself because there's just so many people there. They had to expand. They now have a whole other campus they call emergent campus out there. And what they're doing is they're providing space for people to build a community and understand that it's normal to do these kind of jobs. Um, they're then taking some of that work and they're building it into the education system locally because it's a small town. So, well, not like tiny, tiny, it's like 30,000 people in the town, 50,000 in the area. Um, and they're, they're changing the education system. So these kids are getting access to cybersecurity knowledge and education. They have kids, they have high schoolers competing with college kids in cybersecurity competitions, you know, um, former DHS, NSA, CIA kind of people that are retiring, moving to the area, teaching these kids practices. And guess what? The labor there is 60% cheaper than what you're going to find in the Bay Area, right? What we're trying to build in Canyon City is a proof of concept that you can train people. They don't have to be top level experts that are gonna build the next JavaScript language or Python language. They don't have to be that good. They need to be good enough to operate a machine, to code a system, to build a cybersecurity protocols, do those kind of things. And that becomes in the future, in our opinion, a blue collar job. 
right? And it's a middle-class job. It's right now, it's a high-paying job because of supply and demand. We don't have a lot of people that know how to do those things. But if you can go get Rural America online, teach the people how to do it, you go to an area like this where they're happy to make thirty or $40,000 a year. You give them a job for sixty, dollars they're ecstatic. And you distribute the wealth. You flatten the plane. We also build from a strategic and security of our nation perspective. We can build hubs all around the United States of this. So if you have a team that's operating in Canaan City and there's some kind of cyber attack, you shut it down and you move it to the team that's in Idaho, right? Because you can. We can now. We can work decentralized. We can create these hubs, these networks of rural economics, which at that point, guess what? You're also paying not much more, if any, than if you took it to a developing nation like uh, Romania or uh, Brazil or any of those that you're paying people like a cheaper labor rate, outsourcing labor. So we're building jobs in America. We're paying people a livable wage. We're creating good housing and stability and insurance and benefits for people. And we're doing it in our time zone too, in a base where they speak English as a first language. They understand American culture. It's, it's a win-win for our country. And uh, that's what we're doing. And I'm very excited about the work they're doing down there. Very proud of the efforts they're putting in constantly to be building that. They're getting federal grants now from highest levels of our government saying, wow, you know, you guys have really proven concept out here. And hopefully we can scale this across rural America, get them online. That's just, like we, just like we wired, you know, electrical back in the day and it increased health, it increased education, all these lifelong things. We need to do that with the internet. We need to get people online, we need to create jobs. And we need to reunite this country through strengthened rural economies. And overall, we'll increase the capabilities of our nation. With with my company, um, our CEO had a, a similar idea, uh, like starting like a decade ago. And so he recently, a, f- a few years ago, before um, the pandemic started, he had a, a phrase that he started using. He's transitioned to saying something else, but a cloud enabled rural revival. And so he's, yeah. he's, um, focusing on India and trying to, um, help support the, the rural economy within India. And now the, the phrase we're using is transnational localism. And so it's kind of this hub and spoke model where you build smaller offices in, in more rural communities, source local talent and try and, um, in a way, kind of build out the infrastructure a little bit if needed. And uh, with with one of our offices in Tenkasi, India, uh, a research paper came out last year showing that it it basically in the surrounding area had many benefits, uh, secondary benefits, like people not directly employed by the company. It, it increased wealth. It, it reduced gender inequality. It reduced um, a lot of health issues. And so really just pump injecting money into a, a localized area can have all these uh, secondary and tertiary effects. And so I, I encourage more businesses to follow that model, especially if they um, have it more uh, purpose-built offices and not general purpose offices and have teams that are highly integrated and have a more singular purpose that way they're not just they're not just aligned lo- like physically locally but they're aligned on their their actual work and they're able to um, have a higher degree of integration with the work that they're doing yeah absolutely I, I think it's a win-win and um, I'm excited to see how it develops and the I keep I keep coming back to the the phrase that um, Sridhar Vembu, the the CEO of my company, used. He talks about um, localized talent being similar to like a topsoil, and the issue with with like ur- urban areas is it's this centralization. It's almost like a water basin, and the economic flow of talent removes removes the the topsoil from rural economies and pulls it all together into these urban areas and as that happens over years and years and generations it it removes the ability for these these rural economies from having deep roots and self-starting into um a sustainable economy and so i i do see the this kind of rural support as a as a way of building uh kind of these dams around um uh urban areas to prevent too much uh localization centralization and have it be too much um you know it's in it's an inefficiency you know there is there's a lot of efficiency to talk about 
um, the centralization of urban areas and allow people to transport physically, but it's an inefficiency in that there's a lot of um, waste to be had with with like um, food sourcing and, and housing and things like that. And so if we can kind of just spread out a little bit more across the country, it, we might have an easier time of actually affording the houses we need to live, affording the food we need to live and, and having clean water, you know, that, that, that's really what comes to my mind. I think you change the democratic process to the voting system because you have a centralization of uh, liberal opinion in cities we've seen that already that's just proof and if you can get that to decentralize we have a more purple united states which is what it was meant to be right it was meant to have arguments about what is right and what is wrong and we just can't have that now because this the, in effect not totally but essentially we have two parties one that is aggregated in the cities and one that is aggregated in rural if we can get them to combine there's no better way to build communities than to work together. There's no better way to build bridges than to work together. Direct interaction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's exciting. And that, that's, that's one of the scary things about, you know, the, the hyper digitization of, of the internet and, and everyone spending time on social media because it, it plays into this division tactic of, of like, you get fed the information you already care about because the al algorithm's all about, you know, breeding your attention and having it be focused on here. Well, what gets you pay attention? The things you care about. And so it's it's the self-serving process. And so I, I think, you know, there's there's this multifaceted solution to social division by having this more interpersonal relationship uh, being afforded through direct interaction. Obviously, with, with the pandemic, it's a little difficult to uh, have some of the more nuanced social cues and being able to um, like have an understated understanding of one another. But it, it's it's definitely a route we can take as a society. It's it's the yeah, the democratic process is a direct representation of of our of I, of our ideals and our values, but we're we're no longer being represented if we're we're being made victim of these algorithms that are pulling our time and attention away from actually participating in society. We're not social media isn't participation in society. It's participation in this medium of exchange of information and knowledge within this this uh substructure this this you know it's it's the McLuhanism of the medium is the message you're if your politics and your identity are filtered through the medium of social media that's not gonna that's not gonna translate the same way as face-to-face -face interaction that's that's the way i see it yeah i i agree 100 so yeah it'll be an interesting challenge i think the other thing too that uh doesn't get spoken enough about is that these are global companies, you know, like um, it's impressive what they've done, right? From a business perspective, economically, we have to, we have to appreciate that these are the largest companies in the history of the world and they've done it faster than anybody ever before. There's merit in that. They've done something very impressive, but at the same time, it's like, you know, they're just in their late teens, early twenties as a company they're maturing, you know, they've just grown faster than they're ready for. And mm. I don't think they're trying to be malicious, but it's just the fact of the matter. They've grown larger than they were prepared for or capable of. And they now have a product that is, uh, you could argue good for everybody, but not great for anyone specifically. And definitely not great for any individual culture because in creating, like you're saying, this global messaging, this global ideas, all those things, you don't, you, you start to lose the nuances of life, the nuances of culture. When you have people in India who are now comparing themselves against the United States and saying, well, that's the better way of life or against Europe and this is the better way of life. Well, the reality is that's just how each of those cultures have lived. And yes, you may take parts from one and move it to the other, but we're definitely getting to the point where we're starting to, you know, uh, find an average, become, you know, gray space, if you will, and, and lack the colors that maybe the vibrant world that we used to have, where 
so nuanced and individual cultures uh, is starting to fade away a bit. So I, I do think we're going to, over the next 10, 20 years, I think that's going to come to reckoning. And um, I don't know how it will. I don't know what kind of platforms we'll be using, but I think we're going to start to see local innovations pop up that may not be a billion dollar unicorn investment, but that create a very stable business model. And it's kind of like just, it's the difference between um, mom and pop shop America, which is really the backbone of America versus large corporate America. You know, I think that's just where we're going to head is boutique softwares and boutique platforms. And we'll see, maybe not, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I, I think people are getting a taste for it and it may not be their core source, but I think they will have uh, like, you know, stuck in there every once in a while. So, but it, it, in a sense, it's, it's hard for those mom and pop software offerings to be given the space to develop and actually find its audience. If we continue with this attention based advertising economy. And that's, that's, I think really what probably needs to change first is how do we, yeah, how do we switch from attention first to, I don't know what first, uh, I don't know that a utilitarian first where it's like, how does each person provide the most good to the most people? Um, I, I don't even know what to call the next economy. You know, some people are saying the experience economy, like the metaverse and yeah. all the uh, scary implications as far as the extra layers of data collection that might come from that. But I, I see the same solutions to our current attention economy would be the same solutions to experience economy. It's, it's letting people um, better themselves and do good for the people around them. And so the, the future of, of technology hopefully involves everyone and hopefully involves the, the consideration for, for more than just economic input output, you know, hopefully. Um, but that's, that's, you know, yet to be seen. Yeah. Have you made any headway with with your own efforts? Any anything that's come about with with uh, Beacon or anything within this conversation that's that's given you like a uh, I don't know a, a note to take from? Is there anything that's that's come about recently? I would say probably the most interesting insight we've had over the last five years is after we launched our beta this last April, we got a lot of product feedback. What we were creating, what we have created is a system that could audit your operations and then produce your policies, manage your access requests, do all those things. What we found now is as we were doing that, the audit aspect of it actually was the most valuable part to companies. We had a system that was outputting a, uh, a plain English summary of the data operations. It was a binary, yes or no, we use Facebook Pixel. Yes or no, we use Google Analytics. Yes or no, this or that. And you know, we have 19 uh, uh, third parties that have access to your data, things like that. A very easy, simple summary. And we learned from the majority of our companies that were onboarded that they didn't even know that stuff about themselves, <laughs> you know? Um, so we've pivoted the product actually into more of just an auditing platform uh, where we come in and we can audit you. We can um, provide recommendations as to how to improve it and kind of create like a safe harbor environment. And we're excited to be launching it in just the next few weeks. We, uh, like I said, we had pilot companies in the early beta, but just pivoted over to this where it's effectively the same product, but we cut off some of the arms of it, really just focused in on, on what we do best and what provides the most value to companies. But yeah, it's going to be dramatically different because it's going to be so much more robust in its reporting dashboard and stuff. So I'm really excited to see how that impacts companies. I think half the battle at this point in history is just understanding yourself. You know, I, yeah, self, I self awareness. <laughs> yeah, I forget it, you know, because I'm so deep into this. It's been half a decade of my life studying deeply into the problems and understanding the business models around these things that um, by default, I'm just looking at stuff and I can kind of assess risk. I can kind of assess all these things. But, you know, I forget that a lot of people don't have the time or space to sit back and think about those things. I'm lucky that I have. And that's why we've built the software we have, because hopefully what the software does is it enables companies to understand themselves better and then proactively move forward without any nicks from compliance, without any 
you know, um, fights with higher management and things like that, because we can make a quantitative argument. Now we can come in and have like a DPO who doesn't get much of a budget anyway, use our software, come in and say, Hey, last year we were at a score of 87 for X, Y, and Z reasons. I did, uh, a, B and C, and this year we're at a score of 92. So here's why, you know, we're improving our practices. Right. Um, and, and I think that to create a quantitative argument makes it much easier, especially in a corporate environment where, qualitative research is valuable, but not quite as translatable to the revenue model in a direct manner. So that's our goal, is that we can make privacy uh, direct revenue increase, and we can add value to a company rather than being a compliance cost. Hmm. I, I, I think that's pretty inspiring hearing that just being aware was on its own, like a, a, a kind of seen as a value. I, I like that. That's, yeah. I mean, I'm sure most, most companies don't actually like they have their, their marketing department, you know, go find this data and go find the customers, right. but they're not really yeah. from the top down. They're not really aware of like, Oh, that, you know, that team is actually working with some tools that we're maybe not comfortable with, or, yeah. you know, we're collecting data that yeah. we don't need. And, you know, that I, I, you know, that, that was inspiring to hear just yeah. being aware helped help people focus on you know what what they're doing well, that's something i took out of my consulting for google you know i i left with ambition to change the industry but my opinion was never that the people at google are evil or that they're trying to be malicious it's just that they are in a moment in history where they need to make x y or z results for the business and they do what they do to get it done and they don't because of that because of the pace of innovation, because of all everything, the multi-billion dollar budget that they have to work with and make sure they don't harm. Let's be real. It's a business. You can't go in and subtract revenues. It's not an easy conversation, especially if you're looking to get a raise or promotion. They have to figure out ways to improve the business. They don't always, they don't always have the time and space to sit back and, and reflect. And so, you know, that's what I hope we can do for companies. We can help them uh, reflect on themselves. We can provide guidance you can think of what we're doing like the credit karma for data. We don't make you compliant. We don't tell you exactly. We don't prescribe resolutions. We come in, we assess, we give you a roadmap, say this is what's going on, a full dashboard. Of, here's what you could do, an impact guidance engine to provide recommendations. But it's up to you as a company to make the decisions that work best for you. And we'll just make it as quick and cheap as possible for you to make those improvements and hopefully you fall through. That that sounds beautiful. Um, I think uh, we're 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 hitting the end of our allotted time here. Before we go, I did want to mention the there was a recent news story about Life three hundred and sixty. It's a um, safety tracking app, a uh, safety service app, and it was uh, revealed that thirty million customers uh, their data was essentially being included in this the common business model of selling it to third parties. And so uh, there's a specific aspect of the attention economy that has this separate quality that I think people might be more concerned about, which is location data and real time tracking data and finding, um, you know, information about where someone is. So there, there's a lot of concerns as far as privacy goes. And so as as far as my research showed, like a lot of companies that use this data don't like to really share where they got the data from, even though it's pseudo anonymized, it's not directly related to a person's ID. The issue is that it also comes with a device ID usually and device IDs as far as your cell phone for most people, it's attached to their hip most of the time. And so it's very easy to kind of um, point towards a specific individual with uh, tracking data. So. Mm -hmm. Are, do you have any particular concerns about tracking data? Is that is that something that is prescient for you? Is that is there like a added intensity to tracking data? Do you see? It's all tracking data. <laughs> you know, um, sure, location is that like very prescriptive and accurate, right? In regards to finding an individual, but you know, we swipe our credit cards every other store. We uh, we walk near proximity sensors at a movie theater behind a movie poster on the wall of this, you know, the screen and it knows we're standing in front of it. There are things beyond our IP address or our, <clears throat> our cell ID or even GPS that allow these companies to track us every move. 
And so to respond to you, yes, it's problematic, but there are a lot more intricacies to that conversation. And I hope we can resolve them over time. So with that being said, I guess the last question is, what should the typical uh, user be most proactive about? Is there is there like a single thing that they can do to protect their privacy with with their data? Or are we still kind of waiting on the whatever the solution to the attention economy is? Well, right now, at this point, I think there's still no like one resolution. You know, I think it's great that you know, Apple moved forward with privacy practices, but also so did Google. I have a Pixel phone, I'll tell you that. A lot of people are like, oh, you probably have some kind of burner phone. Da, da, da. I have a Pixel phone. Google's a superior technology. Let's just be honest. They have way more data than Apple will ever have, and their phones are a superior product. Um, you know, so I use an Android. But uh, they also allow me to, for example, people probably don't know this about Android if they don't use it. I can also tell Android only track my data as I'm using the app. I also have an option now that pops up and says, can we use exact location or can we use approximate location? So it's not tracking my exact pinpoint. It's it's the general area I'm in, right? There, Google is making strides too. I'm not saying I'm, I'm super happy with all the things Google's doing or any of them, but it's great that we're seeing progress. And I think the most we can do is continue to push forward. And what we're going to end up is we're either going to force them to make change to keep up or they're going to figure out some revenue model that actually gets them ahead and proactively pursues privacy. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think at a minimum, consumer demand and innovation can force them over time to change. And in worst case scenario, you know, they don't make a change. Somebody else is going to come in and do it and there will be innovation that circumvents them. So, well, hopefully, hopefully that's manage engine and Zoho. Cause we've been privacy <laughs> first for years. Yeah, yeah, We don't, we don't, uh, use third party trackers or anything like that on our sites and don't sell data. So right. go, go Zoho slash There's manage engine. Now. There's <laughs> now. So that's exactly right. I think that's where it's going to head, right? Somebody's going to do it better without all the data and there will be options and consumers will make a choice. Consumers always do. The free market economy over time tends to bear out for better for people. Um, and so we will see. All right, Joe. Well, thank you for your time. This was a uh, fascinating conversation. And uh, where, where should people find you? Is there any uh, call to actions you have? Yeah, I would say go follow me on social media, but that's not a thing for me. Um, <laughs> no, I do have a Twitter if you want to. I, I use it once a month or something. Um, LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn, very common. Uh, otherwise, you know, pulsepolicy.com is where you can find out more about our software. And if you have questions, you can email me at joe at beacontrustnetwork.com. So yeah, thanks for having me. I hope to hear from you guys again and others who are, are listening today. So uh, yeah, it's a fun conversation. I look forward to doing it again. Excellent. Thank you for your time. All right. Talk to you later.